Thanks very much, Julie. Hi, everyone. Thank you very, very much for joining us today. I think I've got a slight delay on my uh, internet, so I hope that's not going to cause any problems. Um, if there is any, please let us know in the chat. Um, as Julie was saying, today's uh, talk is all about the real cost of accidents. And we're looking at this from a legal, financial, reputational, reputational and morale perspective. Um, as you might guess, I am Irish, but I have been living in, in the UK for the last 10 years. So this will have a very strong UK feel to this presentation. So just brief introductions. Uh, my name is Kieran Duna. I am a fellow member of the IIRSM. Um, I just very thanks very much to the Scotland branch for along, inviting me along to speak to you all today. Uh, the presentation will take 45 minutes and we will invite any questions if you have any questions at the end. So thank you very much for joining us. Okay, so on today's presentation, we are going to take a look at a very brief look at the relevant health and safety law. We will take a very brief look at corporate manslaughter and gross negligence manslaughter. We will take a little look at the sentencing guidelines, trends and fines, the cost of workplace accidents and injuries as determined by the HSE statistics. Uh, we will have a little look at the accident triangle and what we might be expecting in the future in terms of health and safety regulation and enforcement. So off we go. So the health and safety law that is relevant in this context, uh, the HSE owns a significant amount of primary and secondary legislation. So that primary legislation, generally speaking, is the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. And then they will have lots of what are called statutory instruments or regulations to uh, reinforce that primary act of legislation. Uh, and then this is then enforced by the health and safety executive and the local authorities. There have been several judgments to establish the, that the employer owes a duty of care to their employees. And the interesting thing is this duty cannot be assigned to others. Even if a consultant is employed to advise in health and safety matters, or if employees are subcontracted to work with another employer. So if you are a company that subcontracts workers out to other employers on a subcontract basis, that employer duty of care cannot be outsourced to that that principal contractor. Uh, there are still duties on the employer, the direct employer. And also employees have a duty of care, which many of you will be familiar with through company training, company policies, company inductions, that type of thing. And we'll come back to that later. So under the law, there are two subdivisions. There is criminal law and then there is uh, civil law. So criminal law is where uh, an individual who breaks criminal law is deemed to have committed an offence or crime and is then subject to rehabilitation or punishment. So criminal law is very much about pun punishing the offender. Uh, civil law then concerns disputes between people and deals with liability as opposed to guilt. So the emphasis here is more on uh, resolving the dispute and working towards victim compensation rather than punishment or rehabilitation. So in a civil case, uh, people won't have um, any risk of prison sentences, for example. And then you have the risk um, when you talk about the cost of accidents, you have the risks at, at the highest level of the risk of being punished, of a company being punished by corporate manslaughter or individuals being punished through gross negligence manslaughter. So in corporate manslaughter, uh, this is all about the business. So an organization is guilty of an offense if the way senior management organize or manage their activities causes a person's death or amounts to gross breach of their duty of care, so bad that it is considered criminal. Gross negligence, no, gross negligence matter, manslaughter, on the other hand, um, death is as a result of a grossly neg neg negligent act or omission on the part of the individual, so bad that it is considered criminal. 
uh, can be punished by up to lifetime imprisonment and gross negligence manslaughter. This is all about the individual, the person. Um, corporate manslaughter may be invoked where uh, there is very serious wrongdoing, but they can't determine an individual at a senior management level that was responsible. So they may decide that the mind of the organization was responsible. So they may then um, look for a prosecution of corporate manslaughter daughter and in the, in the most serious of cases um most of these get used um not that often i think corporate manslaughter may have been used um 40 times in total 30 to 40 times um i think i've found maybe about gross negligence mass slaughter uh, may have been used maybe a couple of hundred times but in, in context of the population it really is only used in the very very most serious of instances so back in 2016 uh, the sentencing guidelines were introduced um, which some of you will have heard of maybe perhaps many of you uh, there are loads of these sentencing guidelines. Uh, the ones we're looking at today are a particular deal with health and safety offences. And these caused quite a lot of shockwaves at the time because uh, there was a lot of talk that fines for larger companies would go up considerably. And so they did. So before these sentencing guidelines were introduced, uh, the only guidelines for health and safety offences were for corporate manslaughter. Courts took a wide approach in how they interpreted the punishment. In health and safety, often the focus was, was on the outcome of the accident. What was the injury? The courts, when considering the financial status of a company, had less regard for turnover and were more looking at profit. After the sentencing guidelines were introduced, um, courts are taking a much narrower focus. They are considering the risk as opposed to outcome. So what was the risk that existed, whether it eventuated or not, and we'll look at that again a bit later. The guideline used turnover to start to establish the starting point of the sentence, so they're not so much looking at profit, they're looking at turnover. There's much more detail on the financial status of the company. And the fines for corporate manslaughter for an SME company uh, the turnover with between 10 and 50 million ranges from 1,000 pounds for low culpability to 4 million for high culpability. Fines for companies with turnover above 50 million can be as high as 10 million. The highest fine that I found to date was 6.5 million for a rail freight operator called WH Malcolm Limited Harrison, who were fined after 11 year old boy made their way into their compound, uh, climbed up on a train, I believe, for a ball and got electrocuted by overhead lines. Um, and there was some uh, unsafe uh, situation on that workplace there that meant workers could also have been exposed to the danger as well. So they received a very high fine, uh, taking the risk into account as well as the, the debt to that poor 11 year old boy. So you'll see different fines in the in the headlines every day, sending continuing to send shockwaves through different industries. Um, here you can see quite a widespread of, of type of businesses that have got fines over the years, including Tesco, Balfour Beatties, Iceland Foods, Wilco's, Warburton's, Travis Perkins, Tata Steel, Keir, uh, Nottinghamshire Council, KFC's, Jaguar. Um, all, all across all industries, they're 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 not punishing any particular industry in 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 uh, in, in any focused way. It's it's all about punishing the the wrongdoing. And you'll also see headlines like this in in the news every day. Any of those of you will take a particular interest if you're in a position of influence, such of us as those of us that are in health and safety, who like to send. Uh, these learnings out so that they don't get repeated. Um, examples here of some headlines, director jail for eight months and company fined £700,000. A two million corporate killing fine posed on a metal recycler for accident waiting to happen. Tarmac fined £1.3 for living tra traffic management fiasco. 
Waste firm guilty of corporate manslaughter after worker was struck big hill by a, a loading a wheel loader. Uh, Bam Nuttall, five seven hundred thousand after dumper debt. Dumper uh, site manager jail for gross negligence. Uh, this cure lesson we will speak about more about in a while. Uh, actually a case I read about where health and, health and safety advisor got nine months in prison after a worker was killed in a trench. Uh, that health and safety advisor was imprisoned for um, not doing a good review of the meta statement, not doing good findings in their inspection, and not stopping the job, which was um, an authority that all workers had. That uh, health and safety advisor was an employee of the company, and they're actually um, employed or sorry, prosecuted under the employee's duty of care to ensure the safety of themselves and others. So that's a piece of uh, legislation that's not been used very much to prosecute people, but it was in that instance. So that health and safety advisor got nine months in jail. This is a real world example here of how the health and safety, sorry, the sentencing guidelines have been applied to a situation. Um, I got this from the Irish magazine, actually, because um, uh, in this case, you don't often see the detail at the end about how these fines have been arrived at. But in this case, they actually included it, which I found really interesting. So in this case, for Graded Highways, um, a banksman, I believe, is working with a road surfacing crew and somehow they came to be crushed under a reversing paver or a lorry i can't recall specifically um but they were prosecuted under the using the sentencing guidelines to determine the the fine so in this case the judges determined that the culpability was uh high for both companies the serious risk of harm was level a the likelihood of harm they determined was medium in the harm category they were a, a one, which is the highest. The number of people exposed to the risk was one banksman and five other workers. The size of the organization's care integrated services were determined as a large organization. And Sean Mer Mer uh, Higarty, the subcontractor, was uh, deemed to be a micro organization. So in terms of turnover, Kears had over 500 million and Sean Higarty had um, unknown uh, as a micro business, obviously, uh, quite small. So in this case, Kier were fined one point eight million pounds plus twelve thousand pounds of costs, and Sean Hager too was fined seventy five thousand pounds plus twelve thousand pounds in costs. So uh, in those different size companies, the punishment was equally severe on both because it was balanced based on their turnover. So these are just some charts. There's a company here called Aaron Knight. They did some um, research into how the sentencing guidelines have had an effect since they're introduced in 2016. So I thought that was quite interesting. So as you can see in this chart here, uh, the blue bar bars, these are the average fines in 2016, um, around the time the sentencing guidelines were introduced. And the orange is the fine in 2020, a couple of years after the sentencing guidelines. So you can see here, a uh, very big fine in the utility sector in 2016, over 400,000. So since, since uh, the, the intervening years, uh, the fines in the utility sector have come down quite a bit for whatever reason, but they've actually gone up in other sectors. So they've gone up in the services sector, the manufacturing sector, the construction industry. They've gone down a little bit in agriculture. And overall, they are still a little lower uh, than they were in 2016. Um, but it has shifted the focus uh, to other industries based on using the sentencing guidelines and how it interprets the seriousness of the of, of the, the wrongdoing, so to speak, based on turnover, taking turnover into account. So the construction industry's average fine has climbed from 74,000 up to 112,000 uh, in the intervening years. 
uh, despite the number of fines decreasing since 2016. So there's more fines, so less fines, but higher, higher uh, fine rates. And in this example here, you can see that in the blue here, you have the average fines and the number of fines. So this is in 2020. So you can see the utility sector has received the highest amount of uh, the highest um, individual fines of about 200,000 each, but there's only been nine. But if you look at manufacturing, the average fine was 140,000, but there was 55 of them. Uh, similarly with construction, there was 112,000 average, but there was 57 of them. So um, the average fine in 2020 for health and safety offences was £106,000, and there was 224 of those fines issued in total. Now, as you can see here in 2020, you can see the number of people that have got uh, prison or suspended sentences. So this also feeds into the cost of accidents when people are individually facing prison sentences and time away from family and not being able to work, etc. So in this case here, you can see that 10 of the 19 fines were uh, put on the construction industry, two were related to agriculture, and seven related to the service industry. And then here you can see how the investment in health and safety has risen over the years. So back in 2003, the average large company of between 250 and nearly five, or just under 5,000 employees was spending about 400,000 pounds on health and safety on average per year. Now that's gone up to close to 700,000. And the very, very large organizations with over 5,000 employees, they were spending around 600,000 a year in uh, 2003, and that's gone way up to close to a million now. So a lot more money being spent on compliance. And yearly health and safety costs for SMEs equal an average of 44,000 or 62,000 less than the cost of a fine. So the suggestion here is companies are a lot better off investing in health and safety than risking getting one of these large fines. So onto the HSE statistics that we get issued every year and that we all, well, many of us uh, digest. Um, so the last set of data I looked for was the 2021-22 year because that was the last comprehensive set of data that I could get my hands on. Uh, there was data released all right, uh, uh, earlier this year, but it was what I complete it was more just dealing with the fatal accidents more so than the, all the underlying data. So for 21-22, uh, an average of 565,000 workers were injured in accidents. Another 722,000 were suffered a case, a new case of ill health that was believed to be caused or worsened by work. In 21-22, the total cost of workplace self-reported injuries was over £18 billion, with employers bearing £3.5 billion of that. Uh, the rest would have been borne, I guess, by the injured person or the ill person or the insurance companies. Uh, ill health counted for 60% of this cost, with injuries contributing to 40% due to it causing more time off. Um, across 21-22, there was an estimated 36 million working days lost, and there were over almost a million cases of absence of work due to stress, depression, anxiety, musculoskeletal uh, and musculoskeletal disorders caused over 700, oh, sorry, over 7 million working days lost. Other key figures, um, 1.8 million people suffering for work-related illness, uh, nearly a million people suffering from stress, depression, anxiety, nearly half a million people suffering from musculoskeletal disorders, 123,000 people have lingering effects from long COVID, nearly 2,500 people have mesothelioma from uh, asbestos exposure. Um, you'll see this disparity here between the self-reported injuries versus the Rido report. So every year there's a very high number of self-reported injuries to the Labour Force survey 
but a much lower number reported under Redor for whatever reason. Um, we'll come back to that later. So this is just a little bit more detail on the cost of accidents here. So I found this data online, I found it quite interesting. So the cost of the employer to different types of accidents. So the average cost of a fatal accident to an employer is close to £100,000. The average cost to an employer of an over 70 absence from work due to an injury is over £5,000. The average cost of an over 70 ill health is over £8,000. And you'll see there how much lower that cost is to the employer for under seven days. So it's a, a mere 150 pounds for under seven days versus, you know, five or 8,000 pounds. And then I guess that's because that when people over seven days, it ends up being a lot more than seven days and may go into months away from work. Uh, and then the cost to employees of workplace accidents. So the cost uh, they have determined of a fatal accident to an employee's family would be close to one and a half million pounds, I guess, taking into account loss of earnings, et cetera, and, and uh, effect on the family, emotional um, effect of losing a family member, et cetera. Um, the cost of a non-fatal injury uh, over seven days to uh, an employee is nearly twenty thousand uh, pounds. That may be because the person is long term off work, um, maybe with a permanent disability. And then the over seven day cost of ill health to an employee is as high as twenty thousand pounds. Again, uh, due to maybe not be able to work uh, in the same way due to their health condition. And as you can see here in the top right hand corner, you can see the number of injuries um, reported in the, the labor force data every year. So you can see on the left uh, here, you can see 2014-15, uh, you're looking at over 600,000. And 2018-19, you're looking at over 580,000. So it's, it's pretty, fairly stable. Um, it, down here in the, the light blue color, it's these are what's reported on the reader. And this is what's record, reported in the, the self-reported labor force surveys. And then the number of employers' liability cases reported to registered with the CRU. Uh, that's the claims, um, kind of out of my head now, UNIF, the claim recovery unit, that's what it's called. It's a government uh, department. Uh, you can see here in 2010, which was around 81,000. And here in 2019-20, it was over 79,000. So some peaks and troughs, but tends to be pretty stable. And then you have to consider as well the HSE's fee for intervention, which has just recently gone up to £166. Over the last 10 years, the HSE have recovered nearly £130 million from the industry for their fee for intervention. And... Um, that's a cost that has to be considered as well. Uh, the average cost to the duty holder when um regard relating to a fee for intervention was about thirteen hundred pounds, but I believe there was a very high one. Yes, the largest ever was over two point three million pounds. So it all is based on the amount of time that the HSE need to charge up to dealing with the case. Obviously, in the most serious cases they will require a lot more time, maybe over many years, and maybe bring in a lot of experts to um, bring a court case to court and uh, bring it to a, a close. So these, for anyone unfamiliar, these fees for intervention are issued from the HSE anytime they come to a workplace and find a material breach. And a material breach will relate to a notice of contravention, an improvement notice, a prohibition notice, or a prosecution. So any of those. So any of you that work in the health and safety area will be quite familiar with them. But basically, whenever the HSE come to the site, they will maybe give some verbal advice, or they will give some written advice, or they will uh, find a material breach. And um, as they were to find a material breach, as listed uh, with you there a moment ago, then they will be issuing a fee for intervention for dealing with the resolution of that.
So we also have to consider the non-financial cost of accidents. Uh, we've, we've dealt with the the kind of hard figures up until now, but we also have to deal with the um, non-financial effect on the people involved. With uh, this may relate to both fatal and non-fatal accidents. So you have to consider the pain and suffering to the injured person, the reduced quality of life and low, maybe lower earning potential. You have the risk of injuries to the person becoming uh, potentially be even becoming addicted to pain killers, which we've heard a lot about in the past. Uh, possible loss of a friend or family member. A person may become uh, more, uh, if they're quite disabled, they may become much more housebound, so they may lose contact with people. Um, other people who are at that workplace could have a sense of guilt. They may be wondering, could they have done more to prevent it? People can get post-traumatic stress from very, very serious incidents. Uh, you can have depression or suicidal thoughts from the person who was injured or the people, again, who were, having, uh, who were at the scene. Uh, people can suffer from low morale, loss of productivity. And that could be with the injured person or, again, the other people at that workplace because they'd be thinking, you know, this employer has not done enough to prevent these accidents. Then, of course, there's reputational damage to the companies involved and maybe difficulty winning new, getting new employees or winning new contracts because of that damaged reputation. So I'm just going to bring you quickly onto this the accident triangle here. I won't spend too long on it, but I, I got uh, quite interested in this when I was putting together this presentation and I was just looking at it going, these stats don't really make sense to me in the modern world because I've been working in health and safety for 20 years. And I said, when I look at Heinrich's triangle, I said, there is not, I mean, uh, you know, for every say ten serious accidents, working borrowers triangle, there's not a death for every ten serious accidents. That's you know, that's not something I figure I understand. Um, there's not twenty nine accidents with major injuries for every with minor injuries. Sorry for every major injury. So I said, you know, let's let, let's look at this a little bit deeper. So that's what I did, and I found a good document by the HSE. It's called the Cost uh, to Britain of Workplace Accidents and Work Related Ill Health. And they looked at this very in a lot of detail back around 1995-96, based on their own information reported to Redor. And what they actually found was that there's actually different ratios applied to different industries, which I found very interesting. For example, the ratio of injury to non-injury, uh, which may be incidents, would be 1 is to 20 in agriculture, but it's actually as high as 1 in 64 in construction. So there's no one size fits all. And what they found as well is for every fatal accident, there may be as many as 4,363 non-fatal accidents. So that sounds much more right to me uh, based on what I've seen over my 20 years. So what I decided to do then was go a step further and I took the figures that the from the HSE uh, statistics for 21-22, and I punched them into a triangle. So here you have 123 fatal accidents in that year. You had 61,000 serious redor reports. You had 565 uh, minor, uh, well, 565 accidents reported to the Labour Force Survey. And then I applied some ratios to property damage and near misses. And then what I did was I divided all those figures by 123 to bring it back to one. So here you see you have about 5,000 serious and non-serious injuries for every fatal accident. So that very much ties up with that HSE study back in 1995. Uh, you can have as many as 10 to 32,000 incidents of property damage for every fatal accident. And you could have as many as 45 to 91,000 near misses for every fatal accident. So I think these triangles are very good, but I think it's important that they keep pace with the modern times because this data from back in 1931, I think probably a big factor there was there wasn't the same level of reporting as there is now. There's, there's very, very uh, 
clear reporting guidelines now. There's enforcement if reports aren't made. There's very good information gathering now that wasn't there back then. So as I say, this now will be a lot more accurate. So we're coming to the end now. Um, I think I've only one or two slides left. So to leave it on a positive note, is legislation and enforcement having an effect on fatal accidents? So I've looked at a bit of a timeline here and I've used my starting point as back in 1974 when the Health and Safety at Work Act was introduced and when the Health and Safety Executive was established. So back then they had five, uh, 651 fatal accidents and 336,000 people injured in that year. Then you'd come forward in your timeline. There was a peak in 88, 89, the time of the Hillsborough, Piper, Piper Alpha, and electric, uh, the electricity of work regulations were also brought in that year. That was quite a peak year. And then you saw quite a serious decline after that, possibly probably sh shock uh, put in by how serious uh, effect that Hillsborough and Piper Alpha had on people possibly. Um, then you come forward to the six pack regulations being introduced and the CDM regulations being introduced back around 96, 97. At that point, there was 272 fatal accidents. So you're talking about a halving. Then you come forward to around 2016 when the sentencing guidelines were brought in and you had 135 fatal accidents that year. And then you come back up to the 21, 22 year. So you had 123 fatal accidents that year and 61,000 injuries. So that actually equates to an 80% reduction in 48 years. So we can say that there is a big effect. Um, I think this figure has slipped back for 135 fatal accidents again, but it's been in keeping with the overall downward trend over time. Uh, some years will have will go up and down a bit, but the, the overall trend is it going downwards. So that's very, very positive. So last slide. So what does the future look like? So what I can envision in the future continue to bring that uh, number of accidents, fatal accidents down will be uh, continued focus on education, training, monitoring and supervision, uh, continuing continuation in the big fines and prison sentences for the, the worst offenders. You'll see a lot more use of new technology such as drones and robotics being used in the most hazardous areas. Uh, you'll have AI in that maybe taking over some some jobs unfortunately uh you'll have, have targeting and influencing practice in small businesses um because according to data there were 275,000 construction businesses as one of the high hazard industries 90% of these have less than 10 workers so you're talking about a huge area of the market there and as you can see compared across Europe the causes um, of where fatal accidents are happening, they're, they're pretty standard in all areas. They're not unique to the UK or any particular country. These are trends that are common to high hazard industries right across Europe and across the world. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. And thank you for joining me uh, at the end of the day, which is really appreciated. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Thank you for that, Kieran, for an excellent presentation. Some quite shocking numbers there, aren't they, in today's day and age? <clears throat> we haven't yes, had I any... Think, I think now... Um... Sorry, carry on. I think we've got Sorry. a delay in us speaking. You go first. No, just because information is so immediate now. If, if there's ever um, an accident or prosecution, you have it on your computer or your phone within seconds so we're we're getting hit by information now really instantaneously so when any time there is one uh, an accident uh, or a, a prosecution everyone gets that information instantaneously so it's that's that kind of heads to the whole shock and effect of it as well yeah and reputationally as well i would imagine that everything's so much in the general public's eye now as well as um health and safety professionals Absolutely, yes, you're, you're right. Yeah, uh, st uh, um, sometimes um, in, uh, inaccurate news travels as quickly as accurate news, sometimes faster. So, um, that's there's a bit of um, 
uh, information control required there that at the early stage of an investigation that people don't jump to conclusions or hearsay because um, I think uh, it takes quite a while in investigation for the facts to become known. And if people jump to conclusions, then that could uh, um, unfairly lead to rep uh, reputation damage as well because the full story is known at the time. Yeah, good point. Um, we've had two questions come in. I'll go to Stuart's question first. Do you feel we have reached a plateau with fatal accidents or could further legislation decrease the current figure? That's a big question. <laughs> oh, it is, yes. I think there definitely <laughs> needs to be, yeah. there, there definitely needs to be something else needed now. Um, I think they've tried quite a lot of things. I think it is plateauing now. And as you can see over the last 50, years there's always been some big step to move things forward another another bit and i'm not sure we know what that is yet when in terms of the these big headline cases with the big fines for millions of euros i think they're almost becoming they're not quite even having the effect as they used to before and i, I think what's needed actually is more enforcement i think the regulations are good but i think the the hse just need more powers to get into workplaces and, and do their jobs i think that's what's been lacking over the, the recent years is the lack of in, in a resourcing of the, the regulator great thanks karen and then this is from ahmed i think this is probably the, a similar question worded in slightly different way looking at the instant statistics the trending looks to plateau looks in plateau trending from 200, 2011 onwards what do you think we can do more so you've probably already answered that question in a slightly different way yeah i think um i i think if we just uh, it's, it's quite difficult if, if we just slow down and work a little bit more carefully i think it's always such a rush to do work and then um then you spend more time dealing with an incident after it's happened, but um, that's more of a cultural thing than a than a legislative legislative thing. But as I said previously, I, I just think that the regulator needs to be uh, resourced, and I think um, companies are a lot more regulating themselves now with things like ISO and things like that. So maybe more powers within companies as well. I don't know how that would work, but maybe more. Uh, authority for the environmental health and safety people that are working within companies because if we are moving to self-regulation then I think the people responsible for these things in workplaces are actually putting themselves risk of prison sentences should actually have uh, more authority and um, real authority. Yeah, it's an interesting one and something along similar lines, but slightly different. So this is from Fiona. We can see that the number of fatalities are reducing over decades. We are making people ill, though. I was interested in the numbers for ill health. Any ideas how this is managed in fragmented employment histories? Oh, this is a huge one. I don't think it, this is the next thing that's for the next 50 years is this, this ill health, uh, Ill, Ill physical health and, and mental health. Uh, I think actually people are voting with their feet. They're 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 working from home. They're 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 being quite strong in that area. They're they're going for working with employers that have better working practices, that have better cultures, that are better for looking after their employees. Uh, people are not willing to work the long hours that they used to. People want to be working nearer to home to have better work life balance. Um, yeah. people people are actually realizing that maybe money isn't everything and uh, that they actually need to balance out their whole lives so i think there is a big shift happening but oh there's there's so much to do in that area there really is i think um we're we're making some attempt at the moment with maybe health screening in workplaces and providing mental health first stagers and and things like that but there's so much more to do i think in terms of of Ensure we're looking at people's whole work day, not just the uh, physical hours in the workplace, but also the commute and things like that. And I, I think there is a realize there needs to be a realization as well. And I think a lot of employers have caught on to this is that people have a lot going on outside of their work as well that they bring to work. And I think there needs to be a bit yeah. of empathy, understanding people that they they have to, to balance out their lives and and make it workable for themselves as well. Yeah, that whole work day is an interesting one, isn't it? Because especially if you're driving for work, I know some industries are 
uh, already considering this but if you're driving two hours to start a say a job driving a train then adding four hours onto your day really makes it dangerous doesn't it in some industries yeah i know in the construction industry some of the bigger companies have actually factoring that in much better now so they're they're factoring that into the working day because if you have somebody who's driving a piece of heavy machinery or a lorry or a dumper or a crane or whatever uh, all day and they're also as you say driving an hour or two hours each way then they're going to be at create a bigger risk in the workplace so i i think there there's a bit of a light bulb moment in that regard as well yeah it is like we've still got a lot to learn we've made such progress from years ago but lots more still to do isn't there Definitely. So, in, I, you know, I can speak from the construction industry probably more than any other because that's the industry I've known for the last 20 years. But um, suicide is so high in the construction industry. And I think uh, make it more diverse. Um, uh, uh, it can only be a good thing because we've been very, very heavily male orientated for many years. And yeah. I think bringing more women and into the work, 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 into the workplace, more diversity is actually driving that realization that there needs to be better working practices, better uh, care to the person um, and then the work-life balance and all that. So I, I think the shift is, has started, but as I say, there's there's so much to do. You definitely need a diverse workforce though, don't you? Because if you have all the same people, everybody's got the same view. And if you've got a problem, you're never going to fix it because everybody thinks the same. Exactly. You get group think and, 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 and things that never, never change. And I think when you do have a diverse workforce, it's up to the employer then to actually listen to what the workforce are saying and, and actually yeah. um, I, I say, adjust the working week to, to suit people's different, maybe religious needs or, or things like that. I know in our in our workplace, we have, we're a lot more considerate now to Friday afternoons when uh, some of our Muslim employees have to go to church and things like that. Yeah. So I think when you're actually conscious of people's uh, religious needs or maybe as I say work-life balance where they might have to collect their child or drop their child to school in the morning or whatever they, um, that, that the, the work becomes a lot better and you can actually it can, it's, that makes it more diverse because you're actually um, you know make it workable for more people to, to work for you which, which is a good thing they still get the work done they just it works yeah. slightly different work patterns I, I can wholeheartedly agree to that because I don't work on Fridays. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm very lucky to have an employer who accommodated that when I joined RRSM. So uh, what pe but you're right, listening to people because everybody needs something different. And, and I think it's important to listen to your employees and employees to listen to their employers. Fascinating subject here. And that's it with questions. I think we could spend the whole evening talking about this, couldn't we? Because it's um, such an interesting topic. So thank you so much for presenting for us today. Um, Kieran is a member of the Scotland Branch Committee as well. So thank you for volunteering your time. And hopefully, that, that's Kieran, hopefully we'll be able to see him. We were losing Kieran earlier, which is why we were a little bit late starting. But um, any last comments from you, Kieran, before we finish today? No, just thank you so much. I know Monday Mondays are tough when you're just trying to get through that, that first day, and especially at this time of the evening when people's uh, attention is probably flagging a little bit. So thanks for coming. Go go get a cup of tea and a biscuit before you travel home if you're if you're not at home already. Thanks for coming today. Great. Thank you, everyone. I will upload the presentation onto the YouTube channel sometime tomorrow. So if you've got any colleagues you think would be interested, you can forward them the link. So I'd like to wish everyone a good afternoon or a good evening when, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you at the next RSM webinar. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye.